before you. We can come with boldness before you. We thank you, Father, that the veil has been rent and that there is now no separation between us and you. Father, receive our praise today. Receive our worship, our acclamation, for you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Receive this, Father, in Jesus' name.
many kings stepped down from their thrones? How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have put out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me?
I'm alive in the arms of love. Lift my hands to the God above. I'm alive in the arms of love. You are more than enough. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. We come to the final epistle. We have looked at six of the seven churches, and we are now moving on to the final church. Now, um, so we are in Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to pick up in verse 14. We'll read through this, and then I'll go back and, and um, we'll highlight some things and talk about them. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I, I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, a couple things that I want to point out just real quick. This is uh, things that are shared in common with the other letters. Uh, Jesus, again, he introduces himself with a specific title, specific to the church at Laodicea. Um, we know that uh, the formula that has been laid out in the other letters, there's an introduction by Jesus to the church. There is usually uh, an acknowledgement. There's an acknowledgement that he knows what's going on. I think this is, uh, we talked about this being kind of a, a, a two-sided coin he is aware of everything that they are dealing with, the hardships that are coming upon them, the difficulties that they face. But he's also aware not just of the, the things that they are doing right, but he's aware of the things that they are not doing right, the things that they are doing wrong. And so when Jesus says, I know you, this should be at once a comfort and a warning. Okay, Jesus knows everything that we are facing. And then as he goes through, there's a formula that he has applied in the other uh, an outline that he has applied to the other churches. Uh, he usually speaks after his acknowledgement of knowledge. He speaks to particular issues in the church, uh, and that comes through in one of two ways, often both. Uh, the first is that he acknowledges what they're doing right, and then he also acknowledges what they're doing wrong. Okay, now Laodicea is different than most of the other epistles because there is no commendation. Okay. This letter to them is a chastisement. It's a letter of correction because they have gotten off track. All right. So we see that the, the outline coming down, there is no commendation to them. It's a letter of correction, a letter of chastisement. And then as he comes to the end, he always reminds us uh, of what will come if we repent, if we don't repent. And then he gives us that final reminder, if you've got ears, pay attention. Pay attention to what I am saying, okay? So let's get into a little bit about Laodicea. Laodicea was uh, in the southwest of what we would consider um, eastern Turkey, southwest of Asia Minor in the time. It was a very prosperous city in the Roman Empire. It was known as a center of banking and a maker of textiles. So it was a very wealthy city. Okay, now Laodicea, uh, the church was founded probably, most likely, by Epaphras, 
Uh, if you look back in the letter of Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 16, Paul writing to the, the church at Colossae, uh, he acknowledges uh, Epaphras and, and he talks about, uh, in Colossians, he talks about a, a, an epistle that we don't have in our scripture that was sent at the same time to the church at Laodicea. Now, uh, Colossae and Laodicea are both in the same valley. They're very near neighbors. And we know uh, that, that uh, Paul acknowledges Epaphras as having gone out and, and shared the gospel. So it's very likely uh, that the church at Laodicea was established by the ministry of Epaphras. Okay? Now, the church in Laodicea, we can see just some things that are drawn out here. Uh, the church in Laodicea was a very prosperous church. They had access to a lot of good things. But there is a, a, a very stern caution in the way that Jesus addresses this church. Now, in order to understand what's going on, uh, first thing that, that jumps out at us that we should always be paying attention to is Jesus says they are neither hot nor cold. How many times does he say that? Ah, three times. Remember, numbers have significance. Three is a number of completion, a, a number of fulfillment. Jesus is cautioning them. Three times he is restating their condition. This is significant. It's important. The Jews and the Gentiles that would be reading this letter would immediately go, oh, wow, okay, this is something that's going to be on the test, folks. It's been repeated multiple times. So they are neither hot nor cold. Now, historically, at this time, uh, the emperor uh, in Rome, uh, over the Roman Empire that Laodicea would have been subject to, um, was, uh, <laughs> and his name just ran right out of my head. Diocletian. That's why I write notes. Diocletian, does anybody know anything about the emperor Diocletian? Anybody? He died? Yeah, that's... <laughs> that's obvious. What was that, Bench? He was a bad guy. He was a bad guy. Uh, when Diocletian first became emperor, he was actually very passive toward Christians. He was very passive uh, toward Jews. Um, but something happened and, and turned his... his uh, attitude toward Christians very, very sourly, very badly. Uh, Diocletian is known as the instigator of the second great persecution of the Christian church, the first one being Nero. And so Diocletian is uh, emperor at this time, and Diocletian did something that was a little bit u uh, unique among the um, emperors of his day. Oftentimes when the emperors were die, uh, would die, they would be elevated to godhood status and, and they would become uh, like the gods. Diocletian uh, is the, one of the few emperors that we know of that actually mandated his godhood while he was still alive. And, and part of the state religion that, that the Romans were required and all of the people in the, in the uh, empire were required to follow was that you had to worship Diocletian as a god. Now, what's interesting about this, we know historically that the Jews, because of the way they came into the kingdom, they were granted exemption from a lot of the state religion requirements, being a monotheistic religion. Not always, but most times they were granted an exemption. However, the Christians who some thought were a branch of the Jews, of Judaism, uh, a sect. Others thought, no, they're their own thing. They're completely separate. They just have things in common. Either way, Rome, Rome did not look at the Christians as being a part of the exemption that the Jews enjoyed. And so the Christians were required to make an offering to the Roman gods and of those Roman gods specifically unto Diocletian. Okay, Now, what's going on in Laodicea is they were looking to keep both ends 
working, burning both the candle at both ends, if you will. Okay, they wanted to hold fast to the the promises of heaven and the things that were coming, but they also wanted to make sure they didn't come under suffering, and so they they tried to find this balance. Now. Um, I will let you know now of all of the churches that we have looked at. I see parts of these, these epistles in these different churches that can apply to the, the church in the West. Uh, I think this one is one that should, should be right up there at the top as a warning to the church in America. And we see this uh, because of, of just go back a couple of years and see what the, the church, how the church was handled with the uh, start of the COVID uh, pandemic, okay? How many churches ended up closing their doors, saying, well, you know, we're not going to have service today. Uh, we, we're, we're shutting down the church. Now, we did that for one Sunday, and I was so heavily convicted of God, I said, I can't do this anymore. And we opened the doors back up to whoever would come. Now, I think that was just a test. I think that's something God allowed to help churches recognize what is most likely coming, the, the type of persecution that we will come under at some point, okay? Uh, right now, we still enjoy uh, great freedoms here in America. We enjoy uh, the freedom to gather together, to worship openly, to read the Bible, to discuss this. Um, but there were dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of citations given by local, state, and even federal uh, authorities to churches that refused to close their doors. Now, uh, even if these things finally went through the courts and they came out as the church was in the right, do you can you imagine how many resources were spent to get to that point? Okay, I think this is something that should cause every Christian in America to perk up and pay attention. Okay, I don't know when it will happen, but I do know that it will happen because it's happened to every country throughout church history that has, has granted freedom to the church. It didn't take very long before those freedoms were taken away. Okay, so Laodicea, I think, is something we particularly need to pay attention to. Now, in Laodicea, they were a center of banking, a center of commerce. They were a center that produced much textiles. There's even uh, some commentators that I've read talked about uh, the mud that they had outside of the city in the, in the river that they were able to take, and they were able to make a salve for your eyes that was supposed to be very healing for common eye ailments. Uh, some commentators have said, yes, that was the case. Others said, no, that's, that's probably not what happened. Either way, something for you to just kind of pay attention to. Now, when Jesus starts speaking to this church, he comes out right at the start as coming against them. Now, remember, in this church, the whole point of Jesus delivering this message the whole point of this is not to kick them out. It's to bring them back in. They have put themselves in a dangerous place. They're in a bad position because you can't enjoy God and not God. You cannot participate in the holy and the profane. These things do not mix. For what does the dark have to do with the light? Nothing. They are two separate entities. So when we hear these warnings, we need to do this self-check. Okay, what are the areas that this might apply to us? Have we in any way compromised our stand? Have we sought to blend with Christ the world? Okay, so we, we're looking to uh, take warning for things that might be coming to us from our Father. All right, so let's get back into the letter and we'll take a look at a couple of things. Um, okay, uh, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. 
There's a, a couple things I want to draw out here real quick. The words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. Now, what does amen mean? So be it. Actually, it has three different meanings. I was really surprised to learn this. There are three different mean, meanings depending on how it is used in the, the phrase that it's used in. Okay? If it starts the phrase, if it's, it is the start of the sentence, it's basically like saying, I'm telling you the truth. This is what happened. Uh, you will see this sometimes when Jesus is speaking, uh, your Bible will translate it truly, truly, or verily, verily. Uh, so amen at the start of the phrase means whatever is coming is the truth. Okay? At the end of the phrase, uh, let it be, uh, that's, that's an agreement with what, was, what came beforehand. We're saying, yeah, yeah, let that thing come to pass. When, uh, you know, growing up, I was always taught amen was just how you signed off your prayer. You know, that's like when you sign your letter, you know, and you sign your name at the end of the letter. That's how you say you're done praying. Okay, we're done. Now we can eat. Okay. Amen was just meant that all this stuff is done and we can get on to the other things. However, when, when Jesus is using this and, and throughout scripture, specifically the New Testament, when this word comes up at the end of the phrase, it's saying, it's, an, it's uh, enjoining, hey, yeah, let this be so. However... The literal translation of the word amen is true. True. Okay. And that's why we can get the two different meanings of it depending on where it's placed in the passage. Now what's interesting is Jesus identifies himself as the amen. He doesn't start by saying amen. He doesn't end by saying amen. It's right in the middle. What he is saying is I am the truth. Kind of like something else he said earlier, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. In him lies the truth. And then what's interesting is he comes through and, and he says, uh, the words of the amen, the words of the one who is true, the faithful and true witness, the faithful and true witness. So we see this, this thing coming on repeated multiple times in different ways, the nature of Jesus, the threefold again, the amen, the faithful, and the true, all of these indicating the veracity of who Jesus is. Okay, He is telling the church at Laodicea, and by extension he is telling us, I am truth. Okay, The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. What is Jesus a witness of? What do you suppose that means? When he identifies himself as the faithful and true witness, what is he a witness of? Well, think about his ministry. What was the whole point of his ministry? Salvation. His, his, the whole point of his ministry when he came the first time was to come and to pay a price for sin, to, to make a way that we could come before the Father. He is the faithful and true witness that what the Father has said is so, is so. He is the faithful and the true witness that, that the things that the Father has declared are, in fact, true. He bears witness to this because he's the one that sealed that with his blood. Remember when you established a covenant? The covenant was always established, was sealed with blood. When uh, God made the covenant with Abraham, what did he do? He took the animals and he cut them in half. They were the, then he walked through the middle and that sealed the covenant. When, when the um, tabernacle was created, all of the implements had to be anointed. They had to be taken from profane and common usage and made holy. How was that done? That was done with the oil and the blood. Okay, so when Jesus is saying, I am the faithful and true witness, he's saying, I'm the one that's saying that what God said would happen, happened. It is sealed with my blood. This covenant is a true thing. Okay, Jesus is, is, is reminding us the authority and the veracity of what he has done and who he is. The faithful and true witness. Okay, and uh, the beginning of God's creation. Now, this is an interesting thing because there are some people uh, throughout church history, there are even some church groups today that look at that passage and they say, aha, this is proof that Jesus was created. No, that's not what it's saying. 
okay? Because if that's what we're going to gonna go with, then, then we run into all kinds of contradictions with who Jesus said he was, and we run into to issues with timeline, okay? Because as near as I can figure, Jesus didn't come into this world as a creation until after a lot of things happened, the entirety of the Old Testament. So he couldn't be the first. Well, oh no, he was the first of the creation. He's not truly God. He is the son of God. You're missing the point. He's not created. He has been. It's, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, how does Genesis chapter 1 start? In the beginning. How does John chapter 1 start? In the beginning. Who's beginning? It's our beginning because Jesus is infinite he has always been and he always will be and so the the very first words in the Old Testament the very first of the testimony of God is in the beginning it can't be God's beginning because he was already there and if Jesus is by his nature God himself, then he had to have been there at the beginning. He's not talking about his beginning. He's talking about all of creation's beginning. Okay? He's not saying, I am the firstborn, I was created before anything else, and therefore I received the, the rights of the firstborn. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that when creation came, he was. Okay? Now what's interesting about this is we can play this out even through all of the New Testament, all the times that Jesus showed himself uh, in the New Testament, the pre-incarnate uh, God, the Son of God. And then in the New Testament, we see that Jesus was born a man. We're getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, can I, I just want to address something real quick. Um, uh, there have been a lot of things floating around and people have heard about, um, you know, why are we celebrating Jesus, uh, you know, on, on a pagan holiday? Uh, why does the church take uh, days that belong to the pagans and make them their own? L listen to me. It's very simple. It wasn't the pagans first. Every day is God's day. There is not a one of them that he has relinquished. There is not a one of them that he has said, okay, this day is no longer mine, it's yours. I give it to you, you guys can do what you want with it. Every single day is his. Okay? And in church history, the church intentionally targeted specific days to celebrate. And they did that because the pagans were going, oh look, hey, hey, we're going to celebrate what, what they call the Festival of Samhain, what we call Halloween and, and uh, Dios de la Muerta and all of that stuff. And, and the church said, no, we're not doing that. We are not going to celebrate that. We're not going to surrender ourselves and worship demons and trees and all these other things. No, on this day, even this day, we will worship God. So when people say, oh, the church took over, you bet they took back what was God's to begin with. So don't, don't get caught up in this, oh, we don't celebrate Christmas because that's, that's a, on a pagan holiday. Listen, we don't know when Jesus was born, okay? I subscribe to the theory that he was very likely born in September. But I am not so dogmatic that I'm going to say we need to move Christmas to September. Neither am I going to say if you think that he was born some other time, I'm not going to make a big deal of it because you know what? It's not in Scripture, you know why it's not in scripture? Because that thing is not important. Because God didn't think that was something that we needed to deal with. So we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Was be Jesus born on December 25th? I don't think so. One in a 365 and a quarter day chance. Right? Okay. The point is not the day. The point is the birth. We're not celebrating the day, we're celebrating the birth. Okay? So don't, get, uh, don't let these people get into your head and, oh, the church is doing this and, oh, the church is doing that. What the church is doing is reclaiming what was already God's. Okay? All right, so let's get back into this. 
Uh, sorry for that little segue. I'll get down on my normal preaching box. Um, verse 15, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now the picture that is given here is not a, 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 a graceful picture. Jesus is spewing you from his mouth, hot nor cold. Now we know the particular issue that they were facing is they were trying to be accommodating to the civil leaders of the day. They were trying to make an agreement with those leaders and still hold on to the things that Christ had given them. And they were trying to strike this balance. Listen, if you straddle the fence between Jesus and the world, you're going to get slivers in uncomfortable places, and it's not going to be a good thing. Okay? Because Jesus said you are either in the boat or you're out of the boat. There's none of this half sea stuff. Okay? We are even warned that friendship with the world is enmity toward God. Does that mean that we're supposed to, you know, rally the, the fences, close the gate, and we'll, we'll all stay in the fortress waiting for Jesus to come? Absolutely not. Does that mean that we are not supposed to be kind uh, to the world? Absolutely not. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. We are to represent Christ and God to them. Okay? So we can be kind with them. We can even have friendship with them, the person, but we cannot in any way embrace those things that are not of God. We cannot have friendship with the politic of this world. And I'm not talking about Republicans or Democrats. I'm talking about the way things are run in this world. Okay? We've got to be very careful in, in the things that we invest our time and our energy to and the way those things can be perceived. The, the, the nature of Jesus, um, you know, he went into the homes of tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. And he went into these homes because he came to heal the sick. He didn't come for the healthy. He came to those who had need. All right. We are to represent that. That is supposed to be the core of the heart of any ministry that we engage in is to meet that need. Right. At, a, at the very core of everything that the church should do should always be being representatives of Christ to this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are his ambassadors. We're the ones that represent him. Okay? So, um, I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is pretty straight up. Listen, if you are not going to make that decision, if you are not going to be all in for Jesus, you will not be in at all. Do you understand that? If you are not in all the way, if you're not surrendering everything to him, giving him everything, then you're not in at all. Because there's no half seas in heaven. You're either a child of God or you're not. Right? I mean, there's, there's a huge difference between a profession with your mouth and something that you believe that causes you to change behavior. All right? So, um, I will spit you out of my mouth. Verse 17, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. <coughs> We're in the season of Christmas, and I know uh, Christmas is a time when there are a lot of movies that are um, pointed to the celebration of the season. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really bad. Um, you know, if you're on Hallmark watching their Christmas uh, specials, you know, you're essentially watching the same story 86 times with different characters. But, but... You know, there are some good stories and there are some bad stories. One of the ones that I like the most, even though there's, there's a little bit of a difference in how I think it could be interpreted, is um, A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, we know in the life of Ebenezer Scrooge that he was a very wealthy man, right? Okay, you know, he could squeeze a dime and get 25 cents out of it, right? 
we know that he had, he was prosperous, he was wealthy, he had these things. And yet, what does, does the, whole, the whole story, the whole play, the whole musical, what does it indicate? What it points out is he is a wretch. And it takes him seeing how, uh, looking through other people's eyes to understand what a wretch he is. He, was, he had more money than most of them. That was the whole point of his life, was to make more money. And yet, he died alone, friendless. Okay? And so, this is the same idea that is being put here. This church was prosperous. It had possession, wealth. It had access to things. They thought they were in a good place. They thought that because they had these things, they were being blessed of God. Unfortunately, you know, remember Paul uh, writes, he says, I have learned the secret to be content. Philippians chapter 4. Whether I have much or whether I have little. Still alive. All right. Um, the, the, the thing that most people don't understand is we want to... Uh, acknowledge and appreciate that that um, we can be content with very little, but oftentimes it's more difficult to be content with much. Oftentimes it's it's dif- more difficult to be content with much because we like possessions and we like newer possessions. We like to have new ones to replace yesterday's, and and th- there's a trap in that, and this is a trap that the church at Laodicea had fallen into. The possessions became to them an earmark of their favor with God. And that was not so. As a matter of fact, God would contend against them if they didn't turn from from this this mistaken understanding of of what it meant to be a Christian. They thought, hey, look, we're we we uh, we're not being persecuted. We've reached an accommodation. We've got money pouring in. We've got uh, a new building. We've got uh, a new. Uh, um, what do we take on the first Sunday? Communion set. Thank you. Appreciate your help. Uh, a new communion set. All of our people are being taken care of. We've got the finest clothes. We're, you know, how, how can God not be blessing us? That is not the, the, the measure. There are churches in the world today that have incredible possessions. They have beautiful, beautiful places of worship. And there are other places that meet anywhere they can. And they can meet in the rain and the snow. But they are meeting because... That is what God has directed them to do. Now, are the ones going to receive more favor from God in heaven or the others? I have my own opinion about that, but ultimately, thank God, I'm not the judge. Because if I were the judge, everything would probably get screwed up. Okay? Just like if you were the judge. Okay? So, Jesus reprimands them You're looking at the wrong things. You think you are in this great place, but you're not. You're wretched. As a matter of fact, you are worthy of pity. And and you need to take uh, take care. He says, uh, you're, you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. One of the things that we don't really understand fully. Ben, would you put some more water in there for me, please? Thank you that we don't really get in in America uh, is that God really frowns upon being naked, people being naked. It's it's something that is reserved for very specific times, okay? And when God says that somebody is naked, that's usually a warning that they're not in a good place. Okay, thank you. Um, And so when Jesus says that you are poor, blind, and naked... This is a warning to the church. And then he says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. How do we purchase those things from him? 
Is this, uh, you know, okay, well, I'll, I'll give up, uh, you know, I, I, I want the, the, the really good clothes, so I'm going to give up $500 to get the really nice suit. That's not the economy of how God works, okay? The, the economy of how God works is that whatever he places into your hand, he wants you to have it open so that he can make use of it. We are stewards of the things that he gives us. They are not ours. They're his. Okay? All of the things. I'm not talking about just material possessions or money. How about time? Do we make proper use of the time that God has put in our lives? Are we using that wisely? Okay? Or are we being frivolous with our time? How about the things that we spend our time doing, those things that we, we dwell on? Are we dwelling on the things that brings God honor? Or are we, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, so I'm not saying this is for you, this is for me as well. Do we spend too much time in anxiety and worry? How are things going to turn out? Because you see, anxiety and worry are contrary to faith. Faith says God is going to take care of it. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know he's going to take care of it. Worry and anxiety, you say, I don't think he's got this. I think he's going to let it slip. I don't think he's going to do it right now, you know. And, and so, well, you know, how much of our time are we spending doing things that are contrary to what God wants us to do? And that's even in our behavior. That's even in our anxiety. That's even in the inner workings of our mind, okay? So when Jesus is saying, buy these things from me, it's not a monetary discussion. It's a matter in how we are going to conduct ourselves, it's a matter in, will we accept the things that he gives us? Are we going to be content if we get the three talents, the two talents, or the one talent? Or if we get the one talent, are we going to gripe and complain because that guy got two? You know? There are things that God has gifted me with. He's gifted me to do. He's gifted, given me gifts. But I look at my kids, and they got so many more gifts than I got. You know, I look at the things and, and you know, I, I hear them having conversations and their knowledge of scripture and, and the things that they understand and, you know, the fact that they can pick up an instrument and they can play an instrument and I can pick up an instrument and I can move it to another part of the house. <laughs> hey, we all have our gifts, right? Except for the one that I was supposed to put in my truck today to bring to Benjamin. I forgot to move that one. Okay, so I'm, I, I want to wrap up with this, and we're going to finish this a little bit later. Um, listen, all of these epistles are given not just for the church that was to receive them. Okay, each of these epistles is given to the church as a whole so that we might take warning, so that we might understand when Jesus is, is happy with the things we do, what those things look like, so that we might take warning for when Jesus is not happy with the things we do and what those things look like. Okay, so each of these letters is something that we need to look at. We need to take that filter of that letter and put it over our life individually, but we also need to put it over our life as a church here at Jesus Community Church. Are we off in some areas? Do we need to rethink some of the things that we're doing? Are there things that we're not doing that we should be doing? How is it when, when Jesus looks at us, what does his letter look like to us? Uh, I, this cracks me up because this week I've seen uh, two or three different times a, a meme that's gone around. Uh, and I think, I think Angie actually posted it once uh, that said that, you know, uh, if Jesus were to write, how did it go? Um, yeah, but what was the first part? Yeah, yeah, if, yeah. If if uh, Paul were to see the the church today, we would definitely be getting a letter. Um, that's not a good thing, but it is probably a a true thing. Okay, and and so we've got to be on our guard. We've got to be on our guard. Not only is the enemy walk around like a roaring lion, but he also comes as an angel of light. We still need to be on our guard, okay?